Dan Kanich, or for many, Mr. D, is not only the most passionate person I've ever met, but also extremely kind and caring, and it shows every day, in and out of class. He has spent countless hours showing us how to make the most out of every song we play, and he has endured more, yeah, marks, in one class period than anyone could imagine. He ensures that we perform to the best of our ability, yet at the same time, he has taught us life lessons that I'm sure will stick with me for, for many years. He doesn't teach and perform as a job, but rather as a lifestyle. And by that I mean he pours his life and soul into everything he does. His story is relatively unknown in the community, but if he cares for his family even, a, even half as much as he does for his students, I'm sure he'll send a message that everyone can take something away from. Anyone who has been able to spend time with Mr. D can attest to the fact that his level of passion goes well above and beyond your average human being. Whether it be for his students, his family, or even his instrument, Mr. D gives 100% attention and focus all of the time. I've witnessed him spending hours working patiently with students to help them learn music even when they don't reciprocate the dedication, and he inspires us to practice harder and be the best we can be. Mr. D's passion for his instrument should be an example to all musicians because even though he sounds perfect to us, he insists that he has more to learn and practices daily whenever he gets a chance to improve his art. Perhaps Mr. D's most touching passion, however, is that which he has for his family. It is clear to anyone who knows his family and has seen their dynamic that he will go to any length to give them the best of everything and that he will always be there for them. I feel truly special to have had Mr. D as a teacher and mentor for the past three years and I aspire to be as passionate, down-to-earth, and caring as he is. I know his story is heart-wrenching, but extremely touching, and I am positive that all of you will take something away from it. Please stand to greet Mr. D. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Timmy. Thank you, Alex. You almost made me cry, but I held on to it. Uh, thank you also to the vestry and to Reverend Squire for allowing me to speak today. Um, everyone has life events that alter the way that they live their lives daily. This can be being accepted to a certain college, uh, choosing a new career path, birth of a child. Um, and then there are moments in some people's lives where their path doesn't necessarily change, but the lens with which they see everyday life changes drastically forever. For me, this happened on June 15th, 2011, last summer. Uh, it was a Wednesday, shortly after school ended, uh, a normal day in our household, uh, hanging out with my kids. My mother, my stepmother and sister were visiting from Arizona. My wife, Melinda, was at uh, my son Christian's third day of swim lessons at the YMCA. I got a phone call. My sister brought me my cell phone. Uh, you could see that her attitude had changed from when she had answered the phone. And it was my wife. She said in a very calm but serious tone, Christian drowned during his lesson. But they revived him and he's still talking. He can say his name and he knows where he is. While processing all of this in the first few seconds, I remember kind of calmly asking questions like, what do you mean he drowned? Is he okay? Is it, what do we do now? She told me that the ambulance had just arrived and she had to go, so she hung up. Uh, she calls back a couple minutes later. They're going to take him to Phoenixville Hospital, meet us there, hangs up. She calls back a couple more minutes later. They've decided to take him to CHOP instead, so meet us down there. I went about uh, going through the house, making sure everything was taken care of. We had a, a not yet one-year-old in the house at the time. My eight-year-old daughter was in the shower. So I, I took care of uh, making sure that they were going to be cared for. I'll never forget walking into the bathroom to tell my daughter, who was in the shower, that I had to go to the hospital. Christian had an accident. I had to be in the hospital. Uh, now. If you, know the, if you knew the dynamic nature of, of their relationship, uh, you're hard-pressed to get them to stop pestering each other and calling each other names and saying not fair and, and so on and so forth. But the look on her face, uh, I'll never forget. It was a, a, a moment where I could see the worry and the panic in her face. And I realized that I had to keep calm, keep her calm. 
So I said something along the lines of, he's fine, he's talking, we just have to head to the hospital, I'm sure we'll be home a little bit later, don't worry about it. And it was that sentiment that I, I kept, kept me going for the next couple hours. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to go down there, they're going to do some tests. He, I mean, he's fine, right? So, you know, we'll be home by dinner, no problem. So as I started driving towards Philadelphia, I passed the Y on the way, and I saw the ambulances and the police cars out front, and the reality of the situation hit me, that that wasn't somebody else who had an accident. That was my boy. That was my little guy. So as I'm driving, uh, I was ahead of the, the ambulance. They, uh, I got onto the traffic in, in on the Schuylkill Expressway. Uh, I was on the phone. Melinda called me. Christian wanted to talk to me. So I said, how you doing, buddy? He's okay. Everything's okay. Didn't say a whole lot after that. I saw them coming up behind me. Uh, I tried to follow in their wake to get through that traffic, to get down to Philadelphia as fast as I could, uh, until one of the EMTs told my wife, you know, don't have them do that. Tell them to just meet us down there. It won't be that long. No big deal. Of course, that seemed like forever for me, driving in that traffic. Uh, along the way, I, I got in touch with my mom, my mother-in-law, my grandmother. Uh, when I was on the phone with my mother-in-law, who is, um, she's a, a deeply religious woman, uh, has trouble staying calm sometimes in certain situations. Uh, but the words when she said, uh, please God, keep him safe, immediately it, it hit me again. It, it was hard. That made me well up with emotion, just the words, God bless him, keep him safe. So at this point, I want to flash back and, and give you the perspective from my wife, who was there at the pool when it happened. Um, as I mentioned, it was his third day of swim lessons. Uh, up to that point, the two days prior, they would wear flotation devices that were strapped to them called bubbles. And the teacher would, at some point, have the kids hold on to the side of the wall, practice kicking or what have you, and she would take one child at a time down the length of the pool and help them back. But for some reason on the third day, she told them to take their flotation devices off and hold on to the side of the pool while she would do the same thing. She did that. By the time she got back, she counted the hands on the wall and a pair of hands was missing. Uh, immediately, they sounded the alarms, cleared the pool, and uh, found him at the bottom and pulled him up, his lifeless body up. Uh, at this point, my wife, who had, with the other parents, were told to stay outside of the pool deck. She looked and saw, uh, she just assumed that something had happened, but she, when she saw the bathing suit, she realized that it was her, her son. So she runs in, they perform CPR, they resuscitate him, and they revive him. So back to, uh, back to where we were. When I arrived at the ER and at CHOP, and saw Christian alert and sitting in bed, I figured everything was okay. Again, I had talked to him. It was nice to see him. It was great to be able to touch him and know that he was there and everything was okay. He wouldn't say much. He didn't say anything, wouldn't say a word, nodded yes and no to any questions that the doctors and nurses asked. But when they left the room, immediately he turned to me and said, what's the Philly score? Are the Phillies winning? They had a day-night doubleheader that day. Uh, and I was happy to say, yeah, buddy, they're winning, they're winning. And he, it just felt normal. It felt like everything was just fine. The doctor came back in, said, okay, we're going to transport him up to the ICU. We may put him on a ventilator to give his lungs a rest at certain times. Uh, which is when my wife uttered the question, this may seem out of left field, but is he okay? Is he going to be okay? Or is there still a chance that he couldn't make it? And the look on the doctor's face and the pause that he, that he made was enough without saying a word. And he said, I wish I could tell you that it's going to be fine. But I've seen kids in the same situation that didn't make it. Even though they're alert, even though they're talking after the fact, due to the trauma to their organs, any residual fluid in the lungs, sometimes they don't make it. And it was at that point, for me, sitting there next to him in bed, realizing that he could be gone. 
uh, you know, my little buddy just asked me about the Phillies, and and there's that moment where, as a parent, when you realize that your still breathing, still living child sitting next to you might not be there at some point soon. Uh, it's tough. <laughs> so this was the most gut-wrenching moment for the whole thing. It, it was the moment that life became so incredibly dear to me. At this point, before I forget, I want to thank and express my gratitude to Reverend Squire. The outpouring of support, words, and actions from our family, friends, colleagues, and so on was incredible. Uh, but above and beyond all else, Reverend Squire was, was on the phone with me an hour into our stay there, asked what happened, how things were going, how he was doing, and he immediately said, I'm on my way. I'll be there. I don't know what he had going on that day, but whatever it was, he, he stopped. He paused it so that he could be there with us, and, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, it was also, as, as I had said earlier, when I was speaking with my mother-in-law, my emotions welled up at the sight of Reverend Squire. And as he was praying over Christian, that was another moment where things, uh, things really got serious and, and made me feel emotional, which is something for this lapsed Catholic here. <laughs> so as we were moving from the ER to his room up in the ICU, Christian fell asleep and stayed asleep for the, never, the, the next several hours uh, under constant supervision from us, frequent monitoring from his team of physicians and nurses. And those several hours seemed like an eternity. A few minutes can seem like an eternity in an emergency situation like this, but this was, this was a long time to have to sit and think and, and hope and pray and wonder how things were going to turn out. Through all of it, though, I maintained that optimistic feeling that everything was going to be okay. And he woke up. He woke up several hours in the evening, about 7 o'clock. He turned to me and said, did the Phillies win? And I knew he was going to be all right. Something about that moment, the fact that he was normal. He wasn't thinking about anything except, did the Phillies win? And I was happy to say, yes, they did. They were playing the Marlins. They blew them out that day. And it was just about the start of the evening game. He, we had it on on TV. He climbed in my lap. I held him tighter than I had ever had held him before. He didn't want to get up. I didn't want him to get up. And we sat and watched the Phillies win in 10, again, with a Carlos Ruiz walk-off single at the end of the game. Uh, so this was the defining moment through the whole ordeal, just knowing that He's asking about the Phillies. He's talking, he's talking regular old little guy talk like we usually have. <laughs> he was medically cleared and discharged the following afternoon on Thursday. We took it easy, obviously worn out from everything. Uh, but Christian was determined to play in his last t-ball game of the season. He's, uh, even at four years old, he was a pretty, pretty intense little athlete there. Uh, he played the game with his sign signature intensity, running the bases as fast as he could, swinging full out, all while his body was still marked, his face still had burst blood vessels, uh, he still had the tape residue from the monitors all over his body, but he didn't care. He just needed to hit that ball and run. He also said that morning, uh, I want to go back to the pool today which was something that we had talked about with each other, my wife and I, and, and we're gonna, we might have to deal with some you know, psychological issues with water and, and so on, but unprompted he said, I want to go to the pool. I want to go in the pool. Two days after this happened. We realized the importance of taking this step with him, even though it was so soon and that we would have to muster, muster the strength to get back there ourselves. This behavior defines Christian, though. He's a model of determination and persistence. It's the way he lives. It's the only way he knows how to live. He has no clue what the word resilience means, but through this event, he lived the true definition of the word. He began private swim lessons the following week in the same exact pool, and six months later, he was diving into the deep end from the swimmer's blocks. This from a five-year-old who, when asked what happened to him, he'll tell you, I let go of the wall, I tried to swim back up, but I couldn't. 
and then I remember throwing up water on the pool deck. He, he knows. He knows consciously and subconsciously what that pool tried to do to him. And he looks in the, into that water and dives back in. I'll gladly talk about length, I'll talk at length about any of the great things and not so great things that any of my three children do. But here's what I hope. This, here's the message that, that I want to convey to you guys. You must be grateful every day for what you have, who you have, and who you have in your life, no matter what you have. This is not a new message to any of you, I'm sure. But don't let an event like this be the thing that, def that makes you realize how lucky you are for what you have. If you have people in your life, parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, children, friends, teachers, coaches, mentors, anyone else who means the world to you, feel thankful for their presence in your life every day and make them feel that you're grateful. This is hard to remember to do every single day. It, it was something that I certainly didn't think about much before this happened. But I promise it is a worthwhile feeling for you and for those that you love. Not a single day passes now when I'm in the presence of my children that I don't hug or kiss them or tell them that I love them with the deepest possible meaning behind those actions and words. They're no longer words, it's no longer seeing my kids, it's knowing that they're there and being grateful and thankful that they're still there because of how close it, could, it was. Only good can come from this attitude, and I challenge each of you to not just say thank you to those you appreciate, but to feel thankful for those people. Thank you. Let us kneel to pray.